In Texas and throughout the U.S., the end of slavery is marked with a holiday called Juneteenth to commemorate that day on June 19, 1865, when the Union Army freed blacks in Texas. More than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the indeterminacy embedded in the name Juneteenth reflects this historic lag in justice. As folk legend has it, the reason it took so long for the news of slavery's end to reach blacks in Texas was that slave masters deliberately withheld news of the emancipation until federal troops occupied the state. But the two plus year lag in freedom wasn't a consequence of bad information or a structural hole in the information network. Rather, the delay in black freedom from slavery can best be described through the new media concepts of diffusion and resonance. The fusion describes a process by which information, ideas, and inventions concentrated at one point in a social network spread to other areas. It describes the uptake of new tools and new techniques. Resonance describes a process by which a message connects with what a receiver is already thinking or feeling. Receivers often feel their thoughts amplified by that connection and are more likely to rebroadcast the message or take some other supportive action once they've received the message. During the Civil War in 1863, news of the Emancipation Proclamation circulated in southern newspapers, in letters, among travelers, and along, quote, the grapevine, the underground circuit of news and rumor that free blacks, abolitionists, and slaves used to communicate. But this data about freedom was not actionable because the southern states no longer recognized Lincoln as their president. Furthermore, the original Emancipation Order only freed slaves in the Confederacy and not in states such as Maryland and Delaware, which remained in the Union. The role of diffusion in this scenario was not the spread of information but the spread of power. When Union troops occupied the South and freed the slaves through military power, the Confederacy dissolved and the Emancipation became the new law. But the communicative value of the Emancipation Proclamation was not without consequences. Rather than diffusing through the South's communications network, the Proclamation had a resonant effect. That is, the promise of freedom generated a sense of hope and encourage slaves and abolitionists to hasten the end of slavery. This new data created an information front that produced countervailing waves in the slave system, ultimately crippling the Confederacy. As Union troops neared southern territories in the months following the Emancipation Proclamation, they would often be met by waves of escaping slaves, many of whom had been expecting the arrival for weeks whole plantations would empty upon the arrival of the Union Army. Booker T. Washington, the founder of the historic Black Industrial College, Tuskegee University, reflected upon the resonant impact of the Emancipation Proclamation when it was read to him in early 1865. It was a momentous and eventful day. We had been expecting it. Freedom was in the air and had been for months. The grapevine telegraph was kept busy night and day. The news and mutterings of great events were swiftly carried from one plantation to another. Some man who seemed to be a stranger, a United States officer I presume, made a little speech and then read a long paper, the Emancipation Proclamation, I think. My mother, who was standing by my side, leaned over and kissed her children while tears of joy ran down her cheeks. She explained to us what it all meant, that this was the day for which she had been so long praying, but fearing she would never live to see. For some minutes, there was great rejoicing and thanksgiving and wild scenes of ecstasy. In reality, it was the diffusion of Northern power over the Confederacy in the final months of the war and not the Emancipation Proclamation, which ended slavery.
But the idea that slaves in Texas somehow didn't know that freedom hadn't come until 1865, two years after Lincoln's original emancipation order, is wrapped in folk legends of the distinctly African-American holiday, Juneteenth. Many believe the delay in freedom in Texas was a result of bad diffusion, that is, that the news of the proclamation somehow was unable to reach the South due to the poor communications in the networks of the pre-industrial era. These ideas persist today and add to the mystique and indeterminacy which the name of the holiday implies. The non-specific number Juneteenth references June 19, 1865, the day that General Gordon Granger rode into Galveston. With Order No. 3, Granger freed the African Americans in bondage in Texas, many of whom had been relocated there from other parts of the Confederacy. The people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with the proclamation of the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. Immediately following the proclamation in Texas, African Americans began jubilant celebrations for days. An annual commemoration took place on June 19th the next year, and there began the holiday. Juneteenth today is celebrated with outdoor barbecues, specialty meals, southern soft drinks such as red soda, games, and church gatherings. In the 1890s, private parklands were purchased for the event, and for the next 50 years, Juneteenth would primarily be a holiday associated with Texas blacks. So unless you are an African American, you may never have heard of Juneteenth. Much realize its roots as a holiday marking the end of slavery. That's because Juneteenth has its own story of diffusion. Juneteenth's innovators and early adopters were in Texas. But a great migration of African Americans from the 1880s to the 1970s saw six million blacks travel from the south to the northeast, midwest, and west coast. And their cultural practices went with them. At the turn of the 19th century, Juneteenth Festival spread north, but the die-hard Juneteenthers preferred to head back home to Texas to celebrate that Emancipation Day. In latter years, as the end of the Reconstruction Era saw rollbacks in the legal gains of African Americans, Juneteenth became a poignant symbol marking the continuing indeterminacy of freedom in the afterlife of slavery, the Jim Crow Era, which renewed racist segregation laws. In Ralph Ellison's unfinished novel, Juneteenth, started in the 1950s, he described the holiday as a, quote, gaudy illusion. The nationwide diffusion of Juneteenth achieved its greatest boost, perhaps, in 1968, shortly after the assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr. In Washington, D.C., to commemorate King, a Poor People's March was organized as a protest in Tent City on the nation's capital in late May and June. A group of delegates from Texas suggested holding a festive Juneteenth celebration to mark the end of the protest. The historian William Wiggins Jr. captured oral accounts from marchers in D.C. that day, and according to these stories, this is how Juneteenth spread as a national holiday in black communities. In 1978, newspapers describe a Juneteenth in Milwaukee as the biggest day of the year, drawing more than 100,000 people. This in a region that wasn't even a state during the Civil War. Later in 1980, the event would gain national headlines when legislator Al Edwards got the state of Texas to mark Juneteenth as an official paid holiday. Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Mississippi were early adopters in the next few years. By the 1990s, as many as 30 states and municipalities recognized Juneteenth as the official Emancipation Day of the United States, a critical mass cementing the importance of the holiday in the national consciousness. The path of diffusion for the Juneteenth holiday after the 1960s is not clear, but its growth reflects the resonant nature of the holiday. In 1980, Alex Haley's epic history of slavery, Roots, became one of the most watched television series of all time and renewed an interest in African-American history. With Jim Crow laws abolished in 1968, many African-Americans began to explore their distinct cultural heritage and began creating new traditions such as Kwanzaa, the black alternative to Christmas. Like Kwanzaa, 
the community-based nature of Juneteenth began to gain wider appeal. By the 2000s, dozens of children's books would be published for the African-American youth market describing the holiday. And in 2008, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton cited the holiday's unfinished legacy in her appeal to end worldwide human trafficking. The resonance and diffusion of Juneteenth lies in its emergent genesis as a cultural invention, a holiday that marks slavery's imprecise end, an end not produced by one single document or day such as the 4th of July, or the Constitution, or even the Emancipation Proclamation. In the end, Juneteenth is a holiday not simply about freedom, but public acknowledgement of freedom delayed.